It'll mean a journey of 1,200 miles over rock and sand, by vehicle, camel, and on foot. And it's a dangerous journey. They call it the land of fear. It takes its name from the Arabic word for emptiness, Al-Zahara. The vast area that was submerged during the end of the Ice Age has never been studied by archaeology at all. And they're not in a position to say that they know that there's no possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age. While they haven't investigated those 27 million square kilometers that are now underwater, when they haven't investigated the Sahara Desert. When we think of the Sahara Desert, we think of endless sand. But what really lays beneath all the sand? The Sahara Desert, it's like a time machine preserving the ancient history of Earth under all that sand. The Nubian civilization, flourishing in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, is an incredible chapter of history that's often not as highlighted as it should be. This civilization, which stretched from around 2000 BCE all the way to 350 CE, shows us just how advanced and rich in culture, architecture and politics an ancient society could be. Imagine a civilization that lasted over two millennia, peaking during various periods like the Kingdom of Kerma, the Napatan period, and the Meroitic period. Nubia was strategically located along the Nile River, stretching from the first cataract in southern Egypt to the sixth cataract in central Sudan. This prime location along the Nile was not just for show, it played a huge role in establishing Nubia as a powerhouse of trade and economic activity. They were known for their abundant gold mines, which pretty much made them the go-to spot for luxury items like ivory, incense and ebony. These goods were highly sought after in both sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world, making Nubia a crucial hub in ancient trade networks. In fact, that was one of the main arguments that the archaeological police used to try to dismiss John West and Robert Schock. Um, they said, uh, show us another culture that's 12,000 years old anywhere in the world and we might listen to you. But we know that there is no culture capable of creating anything like the Sphinx until 4,500 years ago. Therefore, of course, the Sphinx is 4,500 years ago. But, of course, that changed completely with Gobekli Tepe, which is uh, a deliberately buried site, deliberately buried 11,600 years ago. Now let's talk about Nubia's relationship with ancient Egypt. It was nothing short of complex and fascinating. The interactions ranged from trade and cultural exchanges to outright warfare and conquests. There were times when Nubian pharaohs actually ruled over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. This period is a testament to Nubia's strength and influence in the region. The kingdoms of Nubia, nestled along the Nile in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, really tell us a story of an incredibly rich history, full of architectural wonders. Let's take a closer look at what made these kingdoms so remarkable. Starting with Kerma, dating way back to around 2500-1500 BCE, it's fascinating to think this was the first centralized state in Nubia. It was more than just a political hub. Its strategic location on the Nile made it a hotbed for trade. The architecture here was quite unique too, with large mud brick structures called defufas. Their purpose? Well, that's still something of a mystery. Were they temples, palaces or something else? And let's not forget the artistry in their pottery and crafts, especially the black-topped red ware and their work with ivory and gold. Then there's Napata, around 1300 BCE, which really left its mark as a cultural and religious center. This is where Nubia began to exert its influence over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. Think about the Temple of Amun in Napata. It wasn't just a religious site, but a pivotal spot influencing Nubian culture and politics. And the royal burials of this time, with pyramids at sites like El Kuru and Nuri, show just how much Egyptian culture influenced them. Fast forward to around 300 BCE, 350 CE, and we see the capital shifting from Napata to Meroe. This move wasn't just geographical, it signified a shift in political and cultural power too. Meroe was a hub for the arts and industry, known especially for its iron industry and the development of the Meroitic script, an early African written language outside of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. Part of now the problem is that very ancient structures, thousands of years older than archaeologists suppose, may be hiding in plain view. 
surrounded by other younger structures. And the best example of that really is the, is the Great Sphinx of Giza. And these two temples, these two temples in front of it. This temple is just is a New Kingdom temple much later the, even than the accepted date of the Sphinx, but, which is about 4,500 years ago. But the Sphinx and these two temples are deeply anomalous. Now let's talk about the architectural marvels of Nubia, the pyramids. Yes, Nubia had over 200 pyramids, mostly concentrated at places like El Kuru, Nuri, and Meroe. These weren't like the Egyptian pyramids we often think of. They were smaller, with steeper sides, and often featured elaborate carvings and hieroglyphics. These pyramids were royal tombs, and the burial chambers beneath them were often richly decorated. These pyramid complexes, part of larger royal cemeteries, included mortuary temples and chapels, showing a deep belief in the afterlife. The Garamantes civilization, centered in what's now southwestern Libya's Fezzan region, is a real eye-opener about how advanced ancient societies were, especially in such challenging environments like the Sahara. This area, known for its oasis environments, was crucial for sustaining life, and the Garamantes were pretty ingenious in adapting to these harsh conditions. So picture this. From around 500 BCE to 700 CE, the Garamantes were at their peak. This wasn't just a flash in the pan, it was a long period of development and stability. They were ahead of their time in agricultural techniques, urban planning, and establishing far-reaching trade networks. It's like they were the ancient masters of making the desert work for them. Archaeological digs in the region have unearthed some pretty cool stuff. For starters, they found these elaborate tombs, which really say a lot about their beliefs in the afterlife, something many ancient civilizations had in common. The complexity and size of these tombs also tell us there was a social hierarchy with different levels of wealth and status. The goods buried with the deceased give us a peek into their cultural practices and beliefs. The ruins of Garamantian cities are something out of an ancient urban planner's dream. They had organized street layouts that show a high level of social organization and civil engineering skills. What's more impressive is their water management systems. In a place as dry as the Sahara, they managed to create reservoirs and irrigation systems, which were crucial for their survival and agricultural activities. Plus, they had defensive structures hinting that they were prepared for potential threats. Now let's talk trade. They found Roman coins in the excavation sites, which means the Garamantes had trade connections with the Roman Empire. Imagine the caravans going back and forth across the desert. They also found Egyptian amulets and items from sub-Saharan Africa, showing that their trade network was vast and varied. The diversity of goods found at these sites underscores their role as a major trading hub and their interactions with different cultures. Uh, and weirdly, up there near Cuzco, we have this curious stonework, and we also have it at Alakahoyuk in Turkey. Exactly the same kind of thing. Is this a coincidence or is there something going on behind the scenes of history that we've not been fully informed about yet? Um, and, and, and oddly, these, these patterns, these T-shaped pillars that we see at Gobekli Tepe are repeated at the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt and uh, also in Peru. Now moving on, Tassili Najer in Algeria is truly one of those places that take you back in time all the way to the early days of human civilization. Nestled in southeastern Algeria, right in the heart of the Sahara Desert, this area is a treasure trove of history. Picture this, vast sandstone formations, cliffs, deep valleys and rock shelters. It's not just a stunning natural landscape. These features have been key in preserving some incredible prehistoric rock art. Now let's talk about this rock art. It's not just a few drawings here and there. We're talking about artwork that dates back to the Neolithic period, some as old as 12,000 years. Discovered by a French military expedition in the 1930s, these paintings give us a fascinating glimpse into the lives of the people who lived back then. You've got human figures, wild and domestic animals, and scenes that show everything from hunting and gathering to dancing and rituals. What's really interesting is how the art changes over time, starting with wild animals and hunting scenes and gradually moving to domesticated cattle and herding. It's like a visual story of how these ancient folks transitioned from hunting gathering to pastoralism. But it's not just about the art. Archaeologists have found all sorts of tools and pottery in Tassili Naja, indicating that people have been living here for thousands of years. These artifacts range from simple stone tools used by hunter-gatherers 
to more sophisticated items linked to settled communities. It's amazing how much you can learn about past lifestyles and technological progress just by looking at these objects. Now let's not forget about preserving this incredible site. Tassili Najer was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1982, which is fantastic because it helps in getting the support needed for its preservation. But keeping this site in good shape isn't easy. The art is facing threats from natural erosion and potentially even climate change. Plus, there's the impact of tourism. Sure, tourism raises awareness and brings in funds for preservation, but it also means more people walking around these precious artworks. When you think of the Sahara Desert today, it's all about vast stretches of sand and scorching heat, right? But believe it or not, this wasn't always the case. There's a whole hidden history beneath those dunes, and it's been uncovered through the study of fossils and isotope analysis. So let's dive into this hidden past. The Sahara has turned up fossils of all sorts of aquatic life. We're talking fish, mollusks, and even plants. And these aren't just any old fossils. They're often in great condition, which is pretty wild considering they've been under the desert for ages. These fossils got preserved because they were quickly buried under sediments in ancient lakes and rivers, which kept them safe from decay. And the dating of these fossils? It goes back millions of years, painting a long history of environmental change in the Sahara. Now these fossils tell us a lot about what the Sahara used to be like. Fish fossils suggest there were rivers and lakes around, while marine shells hint at the possibility of larger water bodies, maybe even shallow seas. Plus, the variety of species points to a time when the Sahara was home to rich and diverse ecosystems. But here's where it gets even more interesting. These fossils aren't just found in one spot, they're all over the Sahara, which means these water bodies were widespread. Satellite imagery and geological surveys have even mapped out ancient river systems that line up with where these fossils were found. And there's a lot of variation in the types and amounts of fossils in different areas, showing just how diverse the climate and environment were across the Sahara. Then there's isotope analysis, which is like a detective tool for figuring out past climates. By looking at the ratios of certain isotopes in sediment layers, scientists can work out past temperatures and rainfall. Higher ratios of oxygen-18, for example, usually mean more evaporation, pointing to warmer, drier periods. Carbon isotopes can tell us about the types of plants that were around, giving clues about how much rain there was. This isotope analysis has been super useful in understanding how the Sahara's climate has changed over time. It's shown variations in rainfall, helping to piece together the story of how the Sahara went from lush and green to the desert we know today. And it's not just about the Sahara. This data fits into the bigger picture of global climate events like ice ages. So, in a nutshell, the Sahara's past is a lot different than its present. Once a place with rivers, lakes and a variety of life, it's now the iconic desert. But thanks to fossils and isotope analysis, we can glimpse its green past and understand the changes that led to its current state. It's a fascinating reminder of how much our planet can change over time. To people who aren't aware, there's a location in the Western Sahara Desert of Mauritania called the Rishat Structure. It's also commonly referred to as the Eye of the Sahara. And what's so spectacular about this is that it just so happens to match more than a dozen striking similarities to what Plato had described as the lost ancient capital city of Atlantis. Have you ever heard of the Eye of the Sahara? Officially known as the Rishat structure, this geological wonder is something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Because archaeologists roll their eyes every time you say the word Atlantis. But that is precisely the date that Plato gives for the destruction of Atlantis. Picture this. A giant, almost circular dome sprawling 40 kilometers across the Sahara. So massive it's visible from space, but it's not just its size that's mind-blowing. The Rechat structure's beauty lies in its complexity, especially its mesmerizing concentric rings. These rings aren't your regular circles. They're like fingerprints, each one unique in width, composition, and how time and the elements have worn them down. It's as if nature itself was playing architect, crafting a masterpiece over millions of years through erosion. It is a site that most people have never seen or heard of before, which is truly peculiar because it's so spectacular. Wind and water have sculpted this dome layer by layer, revealing a range of rings that tell a story of resilience and transformation. Now let's delve into what makes up this stunning structure. 
and what I'm focusing on is the lost capital city, which was said to be made up of concentric circles, three of water, two of land, which matches the Rishot structure. The outermost rings boast Proterozoic quartzite, a rock so tough and ancient, it's been around for over 600 million years. Imagine that. Quartzite starts off as sandstone and undergoes a metamorphosis with heat and pressure, emerging as this incredibly hard rock. Move inward and the materials shift to softer, sedimentary rocks like limestone, which forms in marine environments, and sandstone, composed of tiny mineral grains. At the heart of the Richet structure, there's a fascinating mix called Silicius Brezia, essentially a jumble of angular rock fragments bonded together, often found in volcanic areas or places with a lot of geological action. The Richat structure is not just a feast for the eyes, it's a geologist's dream. The variety of rock types and the formation's history offer a rare glimpse into the Earth's geological processes. When you dive into the origins of the Richat structure, also known as the Eye of the Sahara, you're essentially unpacking a geological mystery that's been in the making for millions of years. At the heart of this mystery is the uplifted dome theory, which geologists lean towards when explaining how this stunning feature came to be. Imagine the Earth's crust getting a gentle nudge from below, creating a bulge on the surface. Over eons, wind and water went to work on this dome, chiseling away at it. But here's the catch, not all rocks are made the same. Some are tougher, others are softer, so they didn't all erode at the same pace. This selective erosion crafted the Richat structure's iconic concentric rings, each layer telling a story of resilience and time. But wait, there's a twist in the tale, thanks to Jimmy Corsetti. The question becomes, is it big enough to be a city with possibly millions of people? Because the way it was described is that it was a city that was said to be busy all day, all night, rich in trade, with languages spoken from all over. He floats a rather intriguing idea that maybe, just maybe, ancient humans had a hand in sculpting the Rishat structure. While this leans more towards speculation, it's a fascinating thought that adds a pinch of mystery to an already captivating story. Now let's talk about the Sahara Desert the Richat structure's vast, arid home. This desert environment, with its relentless wind erosion, has been a key player in shaping the structure. But remember, the Sahara wasn't always a desert. And what people don't realize is that Sahara Africa, up until about 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, was totally green. It has seen its fair share of climatic roller coasters over millions of years, each phase leaving its mark on the rate and style of erosion at the site. The rocks at the Risha structure are ancient historians, some dating back over 600 million years, offering a glimpse into the Earth's early days, continental drifts, and the dawn of life. The creation of the Risha structure wasn't an overnight affair. It was a marathon of geological activity, from the shifting of tectonic plates to the whims of climate change, all contributing to the structure's unique appearance. Erosion played the role of the sculptor, methodically revealing the different layers of rock beneath. One of the most striking aspects of the Rishat structure is its near-perfect circular pattern, a feature so distinctive that astronauts use it as a space landmark. Even if you went to Mortania, so you could see this from space, um, astronauts use it as a locator, and they weren't really familiar or aware of it until the Gemini missions in the early 1960s. It's a mesmerizing pattern that stands out in the vastness of the Sahara. Plato's tales of Atlantis nestled within his dialogues Timaeus and Critias really do spark the imagination, don't they? Written in the 4th century BC, at a time when Athens was basking in its golden era of philosophy and culture, Plato wasn't just any philosopher. He was a master of exploring deep concepts about society, ethics, and the nature of reality itself. Through these dialogues, it's like he's engaging in a spirited chat, using his characters to weave through various ideas and viewpoints. Then there's Atlantis, this mythical island city that Plato claimed existed beyond the Pillars of Hercules, as a, which we commonly associate with the Strait of Gibraltar today. He didn't hold back on the details, portraying Atlantis as a gargantuan landmass, outstripping the size of Libya and Asia put together. The description of its layout is nothing short of fascinating, featuring a series of concentric rings of land and sea that would have required an extraordinary feat of engineering to construct, with its elaborate canals and bridges. At the core of Atlantis was its fertile central plain, a farmer's dream, encircled by towering mountains that offered both a wealth of resources and a natural fortress. 
but the allure of Atlantis extended beyond its geography. Plato painted a picture of a city flush with resources and technological prowess, boasting an abundance of metals like the enigmatic orichalcum, alongside gold and silver. The infrastructure was ahead of its time, complete with sophisticated water systems, majestic temples, grand palaces and bustling docks. Yet Atlantis was more than its physical attributes. Plato envisioned a society with a rich tapestry of laws, traditions and governance, underpinned by a formidable military might. However, as the narrative unfolds, Atlantis transitions from a utopian exemplar to a cautionary tale of corruption and decline, ultimately leading to its downfall. This story, layered with intricate details and moral undertones, continues to captivate and fuel the imagination, a testament to Plato's enduring legacy. While there's a resemblance to Plato's Atlantis, the geographical settings throw us for a loop. The Riche structure sits in the heart of the Sahara, far from the Atlantic Ocean, where Atlantis was said to be. But another little detail that most people aren't aware of, because they think of Atlantis like, oh, it must be at the bottom of the ocean. Well, that's not exactly how Plato worded it. Like, a lot of people see the Sahara Desert, and they don't realize that this place was unbelievably different than it is today. This discrepancy hasn't stopped theorists from suggesting that perhaps the Sahara's landscape was vastly different in the past, possibly even near water, or more hospitable than today's arid expanse. The eye of the Sahara isn't just a geological wonder, it's a treasure trove of archaeological finds that shed light on ancient human life. Stone tools scattered around the area, including arrowheads, scrapers and axes, tell tales of hunting and crafting, Pottery fragments whisper secrets of domestic life, indicating a significant leap in cultural and technological evolution. But it's the remnants of potential permanent settlements that really pique our curiosity, suggesting that this wasn't merely a waypoint for nomads, but a home for a settled community. The rock art adorning cliff faces and cave interiors near the Risha structure is nothing short of mesmerizing. These paintings and engravings, featuring animals like antelopes and elephants, transport us to a time when the Sahara thrived with life. Human figures and abstract designs depicted in these artworks offer glimpses into the social, cultural and possibly spiritual lives of these ancient peoples. The rock art adorning cliff faces and cave interiors near the Rishat structure is nothing short of mesmerizing. These archaeological discoveries are not just remnants of a bygone era, they're pieces of a puzzle that help us piece together the story of human existence and evolution in the Sahara. They speak of adaptation and resilience in the face of climatic shifts that transformed a once lush region into the vast desert we see today. The prospect of permanent settlements, while still under investigation, opens new chapters in the story of African prehistory, enriching our understanding of early human societies on this diverse continent. It's a testament to the power of the past, and how even the smallest clues can illuminate the vast tapestry of human history.